I have the pleasure of introducing Gary Wong today. Gary has been with the faculty for about a year and uh, we're very happy to have him here with his unique talents. Gary uh, was uh, born in South, uh, South China, but then uh, moved to the United States and got his baccalaureate degree at Berkeley. And after that, went to Albert Einstein Medical School. And uh, after that, completed his cardiology fellowship at Stony Brook. And uh, as if that weren't enough, he then did an advanced um, imaging fellowship uh, at Methodist in Houston. And I I think he's probably the only faculty member who's level three trained in both CT and echocardiography. Uh, so uh, I'm pleased to have uh, Gary talk to us today about uh, CT and some of the physiologic applications of that. Uh, CT is mimicking echo in that being, it not only is showing what things look like, but how they work. So Gary, thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Ted, for the kind words. I um, also want to say thank you for being such a uh, great mentor in the past year and being so supportive. I really appreciate it. All right, so let's get started. So today I'll be talking about um, coronary CTA, uh, functional assessment of coronary artery disease. I have no disclosures. So let's start off with the case. We have a 79-year-old female. She has a history of diabetes, and she presents with first threat. What's the next step? Um, so this patient is at moderate risk for CAD, and so oftentimes we send this patient for exercise ECG test, exercise uh, or a, a stress echo or nuclear stress test. Uh, but there is a fourth option, and that's coronary CTA. So um, I'd like to talk about the uh, basics of coronary CT angiography. Um, I'll touch on the scientific basis of CT-derived fractional flow reserve, or FFRCT, um, and CT myocardial perfusion imaging, um, or CT fusion, and I'll provide some evidence for these uh, modalities and talk about future directions as well. <clears throat> so why is non-invasive testing so important? Well, it's because of over-utilization of invasive procedures. Uh, this study by Patel in 2010 um, and also in 2014 showed that over half of patients who undergo invasive angiograms have no obstructive disease. So 55% of those who get CATS um, have no obstruction. And so we'd like to have a gatekeeper for this invasive test. Um, and one of them is coronary CT angiography. Uh, this is an example of the ischemic cascade. Um, on the far left is anatomical, and the right is functional um, evaluation. And on the x-axis is time from ischemia onset. And as you can see, coronary CTA is all the way to the left, which means um, it actually detects subclinical CAD before you have any ischemia at all. Uh, CFR will detect um, ischemia, so will uh, myocardial perfusion imaging with SPECT. Um, and then you have uh, systolic dysfunction, which you detect with stress echo, and then exercise ECG and flux with ECG chains. But the first thing you see before you see any ischemia, you can actually visualize the coronary arteries uh, with CTA. Okay, this is an example of the coronary CTA protocol. Um, so the first thing we do is we look to see if the patient's heart rate is well controlled. Uh, we want to make sure the heart rate is less than 60 to 65 beats per minute. And if that's not the case, then we give them metoprolol or ibabardine, typically, um, to slow the heart rate down so we can better visualize the coronary arteries. Um, if we give them oral metoprolol, it's usually 30 to 60 minutes before the CT scan. And if it's IV, it's right before the CT. And then when the patient's on the table, we give them nitroglycerin to dilate the coronary arteries. Um, so again, we can better visualize the coronary arteries, and then we scan the patient. These are just some examples of uh, coronary CTA. So the far left, um, you see an image of uh, the right coronary artery giving off the PDA here. Um, and you can see that the, the lumen is very clear. There's no artifacts. Um, it's otherwise a great study. In the top middle image, you see moderate stenosis, mostly non-calcified plaque um, in the middle of the coronary artery. Um, again, no artifacts. Also a great study. Um, and in the top right image, you see um, a 3D reconstructed view of the coronary arteries, and you see severe stenosis in RCA here. Um, and also there's some disease in the LAD and circumflex. Um, the bottom left uh, image is an image of the heart with a graft. So there's severe stenosis in the native vessels. Um, there's some calcium in the aorta and also some mitral amyloid calcification, um, but the lemograph otherwise looks pretty patent. And this um, middle bottom image 
is the uh, 3D reconstructed view of the heart. And you can see it's happening this venous grass um, coming from the aorta touching down uh, on the coronary artery. So these are just some examples of coronary CT angiograms. And the current indications for coronary CTA are patients at low to intermediate uh, pretest probability of CAD, uh, patients who can't exercise, uh, patients with acute chest pain with normal ECGs and negative troponins, so again, more the low intermediate uh, risk, uh, patients with equivocal stress tests, and in patients with new onset systolic heart failure, in which you want to do an ischemic evaluation, but you don't quite want to do invasive um, uh, um, and then patients with coronary anomalies as well. Okay, next I'll touch on the uh, coronary uh, CTA trials and some data behind coronary CTA. The first uh, study I'll talk about is the CONFIRM registry, which is a three-year survival uh, study in more than 23,000 patients without known CAD. And the CAD was stratified by coronary CTA. So as you expect, um, on the y-axis is survival probability that the more vessels that are uh, involved, the worse the outcome. So you have lower survival with three vessel and then two vessel. But what's interesting is that they found that the outcomes of non-obstructive CAD were equal to that of one vessel obstructive CAD, which was a little unexpected, I think. Um, so it shows that even in patients with non-obstructive CAD defined as um, stenosis less than 50%, it still portends a worse prognosis compared to patients with normal coronary artery. All right, and one of the pivotal trials um, in coronary CTA was the PROMISE trial that was published in 2014. Um, it's a randomized control trial of 10,000 patients, uh, patients at low to intermediate risk. Uh, patients have um, chest pain uh, at 73% and some have typical angina, and they're randomized to anatomic testing with CTA versus functional um, exam. And that's usually uh, stress myocardial perfusion imaging with SPECT. Um, most of these patients receive that. Some got stress echo and some received uh, exercise stress ECG, and they were followed for two years. And the results, um, the primary outcome is basically MACE, um, or uh, more specifically, mortality, MI, and stable angina, or procedural complications. And it showed no difference, basically. Um, if you see on this graph here, anatomic testing and functional testing essentially overlap um, here. All right, and a following uh, trial is the Scott Hart trial, just published in Lancet in 2015. Um, this protocol is a little bit different, um, and these are patients, uh, and this, this occurred in Scotland, um, so it's called Scott Hart. Uh, it's patients who are referred by, from primary care to a uh, chest pain clinic consult, and in Scotland, uh, routine assessment is usually exercise ECG, um, and so they're randomized to standard care, and 85% of them, again, receive an exercise ECG. Um, only some received a nuclear and a fair few received a stress echo. Um, and the other arm is coronary CTA plus standard care, which is again, exercise ECG. And they followed these patients for uh, five years. And the results here were uh, quite different from PROMISE trial. Um, you can see the primary endpoint here is death from CAD or non-fatal MI, which you can see in this uh, figure right, right here. You can see that the uh, coronary CTA cumulative in incidence is 40 uh, is 41 percent less than that of standard care, which is very different from, from promise, and it's driven mostly by non-fatal MIs. Um, but it is uh, it's quite a different result. And so the question is, why is it so so different? Um, one of the, the the one of the main reasons is probably because of a difference in treatment. Um, patients in the Scott the Scott Hart trial. Um, 23% of those had a change in treatments because the primary care doctors were actually recommended to change their management based on the CTA results. So the patients who uh, should have had a cancellation in treatment of preventive therapy like aspirin statin because they found no CAD on CTA, um, they had a cancellation um, similar with anti-angelo medications like beta blockers. And in patients, um, in patients who should be receiving aspirin or statins, uh, they were placed on that. And this uh, blue is the coronary CTA. So uh, the, the patients had, again, a 3.5 increase in preventive therapy uh, compared to standard of care um, in the CTA arm, um, compared to only a 1.7-fold increase in the PROMISE trial. That's probably why there's such a difference in outcome. And because of these trials, um, the UK came out with uh, a nice guidelines update, which is basically a guidelines of how they manage patients. And the biggest uh, update for us is that um, in any patients with typical or atypical chest pain, 
they were referred directly to diagnostic imaging. And the first line diagnostic test is actually a coronary CTA, um, followed by only functional testing if the coronary CTA is non-diagnostic or if the diagnosis is uncertain. Um, so that's in the UK. And uh, just a few months ago, the European Society of Cardiology guideline update um, it's that they actually elevated the indication of coronary CTA from class two to class one, where if any patients have um, a suspicion for C CAD, um, they could either get a coronary CTA or a functional test, basically a stress test. Um, so again, in the UK, CTA is the first line um, diagnostic test, and in Europe, it's at least as recommended as a, a stress test. And one of uh, the benefits of coronary CTA is its low radiation exposure. So this is just uh, a, uh, a graph showing that uh, the annual background radiation in the US, you uh, get three millisieverts a year, uh, chest X-ray is uh, 0.02, PCI is actually 17, um, a nuclear stress test is about 11 millisieverts, and a PET scan is five. And a coronary CTA uh, with the newest uh, protocol is only three millisieverts, and actually with flash protocol, it's, it's maybe even less than one. So um, the radiation exposure is not, not that high. Um, but coronary CTA, like with any test, um, has its limitations. One of them is if a patient has tachycardia, um, if we can't control the heart rate to less than 60, or if they're AFib, um, then you have these step artifacts. And so as you can see, it's very difficult um, in this top, top uh, left, -hand quarter, uh, left, left hand corner image to see the coronary lumens in these uh, areas. And also in patients with severe calcification or stents, you can have blooming artifacts um, and beam hardening artifacts. It's very difficult to see the uh, lumen of the artery. So you can see here in a patient with severe calcification, you can't really see the lumen. Um, and you might think it's severely stenosed, but on a cat, it's actually non-obstructive. Um, also obesity um, can make uh, the lumen difficult to see as well. So there's a patient with normal BMI in the lower left-hand corner image. You can see the zoom in very well, but here, because of soft tissue attenuation, it's very difficult to see and uh, assess the gnosis. And one of the biggest strengths um, of coronary CTA is its high sensitivity. Because you're actually able to visualize the coronary artery, you can rule out disease. And so the sensitivity for coronary CTA is 95 to 99%, basically higher than any of these other tests. Um, the problem is the specificity probably uh, among the lowest, and it's only 64 to 83 percent, um, again, because of those limitations I just mentioned. And this is from the ESC guidelines. So again, uh, the strengths are um, you're able to characterize subclinical and flow-limiting CAD. You can identify patients who are likely to benefit from preventive therapies, as I showed in the Scott Hart trial. Um, it's highly um, accurate, again, based mostly on its high specificity. And it's actually the best non-invasive study to rule out CAD for that reason. Limitations, I just mentioned lower specificity. Um, you can't assess the physiologic significance of CAD because you can't actually look for ischemia. It's still only an anatomic test. And technical limitations as well, if a patient can't get beta blocker and to slow their heart rate, um, if they can't take nitroglycerin, it makes visualization of the arteries very difficult. And also if they can't take contrast because of allergies or uh, AKI, then uh, it's, it's difficult to assess as well. All right, so let's go back to our patient. So again, we have a, a patient at intermediate risk um, for CAD. What's the next step? So we decided to get a uh, coronary CTA. And the way we grade it is um, we actually give them a number. So zero is normal. Uh, one is minimal stenosis, uh, basically less than 25%. Uh, two is mild, 25 to 49. Moderate, 50 to 69. Severe, 70 to 10. 99% stenosis. And this patient had intermediate stenosis. They have mostly non calcified plaque in the mid LED here. Um, and this is just a straight inversion of the coronary artery. And this is a cross sectional view of the coronary artery here. So it basically shows that it's moderately stenosed. All right, so what should the, the next step be? Um, it's either stress echo, you can actually opt for a SPECT perfusion study, or a CAT. Um, plus or minus fractional flow reserve. And so any of these results, I mean, um, any of these studies would actually be, uh, would actually not be wrong. But what's a problem with FFR is it's invasive. Um, it requires extra time and radiation. It's more costly. 
um, and FFR requires vasodilator administration. So this is just a um, bigger uh, image showing that. Basically, you have a pressure wire across the stenosed artery, and you give adenosine and, and look for the pressure drop across it. So then with coronary CTA, are we actually able to get functional information from anatomic data? As I mentioned, that's one of the weaknesses of coronary CTA. And with new developments, the answer is yes. And um, one of the ways is CT-derived FFR, a CT-derived fractional flow reserve. And the way we um, get this uh, data is we first get a cardiac C CT here, and then we send it to a vendor. Um, the only FDA-approved vendor uh, in the US is HeartFlow, it's a company in, in, in the South Bay area. So then we send it to this vendor. Um, they do FFR uh, CT analysis, and you get a 3D model of the heart, as you can see in this image in the top right. Um, and then they do computer analysis of the impact of stenosis on blood flow using something called computational fluid dynamics. Um, it's basically you know, advanced math uh, to figure out um, how stenosis the artery is and to get an um, estimation on blood flow. And uh, they, they apply this math to um, aerodynamics like planes and cars, um, and they're doing so in the coronary arteries here. Um, HeartFlow isn't the only company that's involved in FFR CT analysis. Um, other companies include CAS, Virtual FFR, you can see here. Um, GE started doing that as well, and Siemens also. Um, but HeartFlow, again, is the only FDA approved uh, company for that. Um, and you basically get this image, and you, you get color-coded um, image of the coronary artery. So blue means it's, it's normal, and the more red it is, it means the more um, reduced in blood flow it is. So you can see here, um, it's 0.87 again, anything greater than 0.8 is normal. And this is normal 0.7, but as you go down the LED, uh, this is 0.65, so it becomes more abnormal. It makes it really easy to see. And um, one of the trials um, for FFRCT that's pivotal is the NXT trial. So this study uh, looked at 254 patients suspected of having CAD. They underwent invasive coronary angiography and FFR at the gold standard, as well as uh, coronary CTA and FFRCT. And they compared FFR CT to coronary CTA for demonstration of ischemia as a primary endpoint. And the result is um, they found increased accuracy with FFR CT compared to uh, coronary CTA alone. And this um, graph demonstrates that really well. Um, <clears throat> X axis is sensitivity, Y axis is specificity. And you can see this green is coronary CTA by itself, and this red is FFR CT. You can see this jump an increase in accuracy from 65 to 86%, all from this increase in specificity from 60% to 86%. So it addresses the weakness of coronary CTA in the low specificity. And the sensitivity stays the same at about 83 or 84%. That's the per patient um, analysis. And actually the per vessel analysis, you actually have an even greater jump in specificity from 34% to 79%. Sensitivity remains pretty similar. And the accuracy again goes up about 30 points. Very impressive study. Um, and another study that I'll talk about just was published a few months ago. Um, it's the Pacific trial. So this is actually the first study, head-to-head um, -head comparison involving FFRCT. And in this study, they compared FFRCT compared to PET scan um, and coronary CTA alone and spec imaging with uh, basically nuclear tests. And they compared each of these modalities to a cath plus FFR. And they showed, um, this is a uh, receiver operating characteristic curve here, and the, um, the one with the greatest area under the curve is the FFR, CT1, right here, in this blue line. And the second is followed by um, head scanning, and then coronary CTA alone, and SPECT um, has the lowest accuracy in the study. And this is just a, a graph showing um, FFR-CT correlation with invasive FFR. And as you can see, um, FFR CT and FFR are very concordant in 87% of cases. 10% uh, showed FFR CT positive and a negative invasive FFR, and 3% vice versa, but it's otherwise very concordant, as you can see here. So, some strengths of FFR CT <coughs> it's, it's not invasive, um, it doesn't require additional radiation, no additional scan time, no change in the scanning protocol and you're not giving a, con a cardiac uh, a stress agent because again, all you're doing is sending the coronary CTA results to the vendor to get it analyzed. Um, it's highly correlative with invasive FFR as I just showed, and it improves coronary CTA specificity without sacrificing sensitivity from the NXT trial. And it's FDA approved and uh, in 2017 was included in the appropriate use criteria. 
right, so for our patient with this intermediate stenosis, we're still kind of unclear, um, you know, how significant that stenosis was. So we sent the patient to get an FFR CT, and we got the result here. So as you can see, the RCA is normal. Um, the circumflex also has normal flow. But the LAD here has some stenosis in the proximal to mid portion. And um, the, the FFR CT number was 0.72 to 0.74. So as you can see, there's this little gray zone anywhere between 0.75 to 0.8 is um, considered the borderline. Anything less is uh, abnormal, anything higher is normal, but it's still very close to this gray zone here. So that's something to be aware of. And so some limitations of this modality. Um, for the analysis, it actually takes up to five hours. So if you send it to the company, it takes five hours before it comes back. So that's one issue. Um, it also can be pretty expensive. Um, each study costs $1,500 per uh, US Medicare. And there's still currently no randomized controlled trials um, to show its efficacy. Um, it's still only, again, an anatomic test, um, despite it, it being able to estimate FFR. Um, so it still doesn't directly measure ischemia. And you, because of that, you can detect microvascular disease. And again, there's no clear cutoff point for FFR CT. Um, you have to have good images. And the studies that I talked about excluded patients with ACS, patients with um, stents, and patients with bypass, um, because those um, vessels are very difficult to, to see in those settings. And these are just some images showing the limitations of FFRCT. So top left image, you can see a really good uh, view of the lumen of the artery. You can see some knocked up by plaque mostly here, um, but otherwise it's easy to analyze. Here, um, there's some calcium blooming, so it's a little more difficult, but the vendor is still able to, uh, to do our CT here. But here on the top right, um, you have really low uh, contrast to noise ratio, and um, at the bar CT, the company would not be able to, to uh, do an exam on this. And actually, in the studies I talked about, um, about 10 to 20% of patients whose uh, cardiac CTAs were sent to heart flow they were not able to get it analyzed for these reasons. Um, and this bottom uh, graph is basically showing the gray zone, so FFRCT number from 0.7 to 0.8, which is actually supposed to be abnormal. Um, and then they compare that with invasive FFR with 0.8 being the cutoff. And as you can see here, the diagnostic accuracy is pretty bad at only 46%. Um, there's as many patients with abnormal FFRs as normal FFRs in these gray zones. So that's something to be aware of. Um, so, you know, with these limitations, the question begs, you know, are we able to measure blood flow with cardiac CT? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, and a lot of the, the research that's being done is by our own uh, Dr. Kelly Branch here. And this is actually a review article written by Dr. Branch, um, and, it's, and it's looking at CT perfusion. Um, basically what this is, is it's a repeated imaging over time for myocardial contrast transit. And you're looking at a time attenuation curve in this, this graph over here. Um, you, you can get it either during rest or stress. So basically what's going on is you're injecting contrast and you're, and you're basically taking repeated CT images as the contrast goes in the RV and then in the um, LV and the myocardium, and then it washes out. And this time attenuation curve basically tells you how much contrast um, in, is in the arterial, um, basically LV. Um, and this blue is normal myocardium, and red is ischemic myocardium, and the axis is just attenuation, basically how much contrast there is. And with this um, dynamic acquisition, you can get a semi-quantitative, and actually you can get a fully quantitative measure of CT perfusion. And one of the ways we do that is by looking at myocardial blood volume, looking at peak um, contrast in the myocardium over peak contrast um, in the arterial input. And as you can see, this um, peak to peak would be higher in a patient with normal myocardium compared to ischemic. Um, same with the slope, the slope of the myocardium um, over slope of the arterial. And the slope again would be higher um, in a patient with normal heart as well. Um, some disadvantages are uh, the study does take up to 40 seconds and you're asking the patient to hold a breath for that long. So you can have some, some patient's artifacts as well as cardiac artifacts um, with cardiac motion. Also, because we're doing repeated images, um, repeated CT scans, you're exposing the patient to more radiation. And because it's a longer study, it's more complex as well to analyze. Um, another type of acquisition is static acquisition, in which we're timing the study to near peak of myocardial contrast or pacification, so about right here. And this is where um, you have highest contrast separation between normal, ischemic, and infarctive tissue. Uh, some advantages are, 
you can get the coronary CTA analysis and perfusion simultaneously. It's fast because there's only two scans here. Um, because of that, also, there's lower radiation exposure. And most of the studies that's done on this were with static um, acquisition. Um, some disadvantages are, uh, because again, it's only two scans, um, it's either qualitative or semi-quantitative. You can't get a fully quantitative analysis. Um, there's artifacts involved. And because you're only doing one scan here, uh, peak um, timing of the scan is critical here. Um, and this is just one of the uh, protocols for CT perfusion. If, if you're familiar with nuclear um, imaging, they should look pretty similar to that to you. Um, so we can do either a stress rest or a rest stress perfusion, in which um, if it's stress rest, we do a basal dilator, which is usually adenosine. Um, with contrast, we wait 15, 20 minutes, and then we do a rest scan, and, and then we assess the coronary arteries at the same time here. Or here is rest stress, in which we um, do a rest scan, looking at the coronary arteries, wait, 15, wait about 10 minutes, and then we do stress perfusion with uh, basal dilator and contrast. And um, this image on the right is basically showing a patient with normal resting image. So you can see there's no perfusion defects. But up here at the top right image, you see um, an anter anterior wall perfusion defect. So you have a perfusion defect that's stress and not with rest, so it's consistent with ischemia. Again, very similar to nuclear image. Um, another benefit of CT perfusion is it can actually detect myocardial scar. Um, and a way to do that is by doing the late enhancement imaging at the very end of the washout. So you wait five to 10 minutes at the end of the study for the contrast to wash out. But if there's scar or fibrosis, the contrast remains in the interstitial tissue. And you can actually see the contrast um, in the areas of infarct. Uh, this is just um, uh, a uh, image showing CMR here with late gadolinium enhancement. Um, this patient has it in the um, anterior wall, this one in here septal, and this lower, uh, lower image is in the um, interlateral wall. And as you can see, um, with the late enhancement imaging with CT, you see basically the exact same um, areas that are affected, anterior wall, interceptal, and interlateral. So it's great to look for, um, to differentiate ischemia from infarct. And uh, one of the, the pivotal trials for CT perfusion is the CORE 320 study. Um, with that 381 patients with suspected or known CHCD. And they uh, referred the patient for a gold standard of invasive um, angiogram plus SPECT, so stenosis on invasive um, angiogram plus perfusion defect on, on SPECT as the gold standard, and they compared coronary CTA and CT perfusion um, to this gold standard with static uh, acquisition. And this uh, figure on the left basically shows that the accuracy of CT perfusion is superior to that of coronary CTA alone. You see this area under the curve for CT perfusion in blue, it's higher than for CTA. And um, the two-year MACE outcomes kind of show this, um, that uh, CT perfusion is, is very accurate. So basically, if you have CT perfusion positive for ischemia, it shows uh, worse outcomes, increased MACE, um, which kind of, which correlates with uh, invasive angiography. Similar here, if the CT perfusion is negative, it portends a good outcome. And this um, ROC curve basically shows that CT perfusion correlates very well with invasive coronary angiography, basically overlapping lines here. Um, this study was published just a few months ago uh, in JAK Imaging. This is the perfection study where they, they, they compared CT perfusion to FFRCT directly. So they took 147 patients, again, with suspected CAD, and they sent these patients for invasive angiogram plus or minus FFR as the gold standard. And they compared each of these three to the gold standard. So coronary CTA by itself, FFR CT, and CT perfusion. And they found here um, that FFR CT increased the, the specificity of coronary CTA, which was not unexpected, again, from the NXP trial, from 54% to 85%. And CT perfusion actually increased it at the same amount, basically, from 54 to 87%. Um, and both of these, FFRCT and CT perfusion, increase the positive predictive value as a result and also the accuracy. So um, these are ROC curves showing that the um, lines for CT perfusion and um, FFRCT overlap in this blue and green, and they're both better than the red in the per patient and per, per vessel analysis. So there's no difference basically in accuracy of FFRCT versus CT perfusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, this study actually came out just a month ago um, in, in Jack Imaging, looking at, uh, they actually added another variable here. So instead of looking at FFRCT compared to CD perfusion, 
they actually looked to see if the um, combination of three, so adding CT perfusion to CT angiogram and FFRCT is of any benefit, and they showed that it was. So you actually saw an increase in specificity from 66 to uh, in mid 70s, to actually 90% with this combination of three modalities. And again, you saw an increase in positive predictive value and accuracy as well. So it showed that um, coronary CTA and FFRCT and CT perfusion, um, they're all complementary as, uh, as opposed to being competitive modalities. All right, so some strengths of CT perfusion. Um, again, these are able to see ischemia as well as um, the coronary arteries. You can get an integrated anatomic and functional assessment in a single study. Um, you can use it in many settings, including patients with stents, bypasses, ACS. Uh, it's widely available as well. You don't have to send it out um, to get it read and then wait many hours for that. And you can allow evaluation of the entire ischemic cascade from subclinical CAD all the way to microvascular ischemia as well. Uh, again, you can differentiate ischemia from infarction from delayed enhancement imaging, and you can get a fully quantitative blood flow analysis as well. Some limitations are, again, you have increased radiation. Um, it requires additional use of contrast because you're scanning the patient multiple times. Um, and also in patients who cannot get um, adenosine, so for example, if they have bad COPD or high-grade AV block, um, it's not ideal. And because it's such a new modality, there's still a lack of uh, standardized safety perfusion protocol. And there's some artifacts as well, um, especially because uh, beta blockers are avoided because it may mask ischemia, and the adenosine may actually increase the heart rate. And there's a few artifacts that you can see. The most common is beam hardening. You can see this very bright spot um, that you sent to aorta, and it uh, gives it a beam hardening artifact adjacent to it, so it can mistaken it for perfusion defects. And in patients with arrhythmias or fast heart rates, you can have these banding artifacts here as well, shown in these arrows. So, you know, with this patient with a moderate stenosis on coronary CTA and um, kind of the equivocal finding on FFRCT, we sent the patient for a CT perfusion. And um, we found that this is a sagittal view of the heart um, and this is a rest study, this is a stress study. And we saw that at rest, um, the, CT, the perfusion was normal. And then with stress, you see this uh, perfusion abnormality in the anterior wall. So it's consistent with ischemia. And so we sent the patient for a cath and, um, and a new development, actually, um, which it, it's not our patient, but um, it's called virtual stenting. And basically, HeartFlow offers the ability to actually uh, have a virtual stent. So this is an image of the coronary angiogram showing some, some stenosis in the middle AD. <clears throat> and uh, this is an FFRCT read of it. So you can see, you can see some uh, reduced flow in the distal portion of the LAD. And it actually allows you to model um, like the length of stent and the placement of stent and what that does to the blood flow. So for example, this is stent length is 50 millimeters, this is 40, this is 24, and it showed that uh, blood flow after each of these stents um, were good. Um, but because the, the lesion length was pretty long, they decided to put in a 40 millimeter stent. And this is the result that showed FFR uh, was, was normal afterwards. Um, so that's a really exciting development. And so uh, just um, to end uh, with a few slides, so what's the future of coronary CTA in identifying a schema and guiding management? A couple studies, uh, the precise PCI trial is still ongoing, looking at the um, accuracy of FFRCT before and after PCI compared to FFR. And the decision trial is a randomized control trial, um, basically testing the uh, PCI, the virtual uh, PCI uh, here. And you're basically comparing PCI informed by FFR versus PCI informed by FFRCT. Um, and then another exciting study was the machine con consortium study, which was published last year, basically looking at 351 patients comparing machine learning FFRCT to computational fluid dynamic space FFRCT. As I said before, uh, if you send it to a vendor, it takes much longer, about five hours, but with the machine learning, it actually can do it rapidly almost on the spot. And so as you can see here in this graph, um, of the ROC curve, the machine based learning, which is green, overlaps almost completely with computational fluid dynamics. So we may not need to wait hours um, in the future. And the coronary CTA again is, is a bit worse. And um, some research that's being done here at UW uh, by Dr. Branch is um, the SCADA acquisition. So, as I said before, with dynamic scanning, um, it actually requires more uh, radiation because you're doing multiple scans. Um, as the contrast goes through the heart. But SCADA acquisition is a combination of static and dynamic um, acquisition in which you can actually acquire 
uh, quantitative analysis with SVOS3 CT scan. So it reduces the, the um, radiation from 2.5 to 5 millisieverts all the way down to about 0.5 millisieverts, so like a five to 10 fold decrease in, in radiation. And um, another trial that we're involved in at UW is the CT perfusion pro study. Um, it's an international randomized control study looking at outcomes of patients who got CT perfusion. Um, and they looked at uh, patients with intermediate to high risk. So uh, it's, a, it's a two year study with 2000 patients. So um, those results are pending. So in summary, um, factors that favor FFRCT are patients who cannot get uh, stressor agents um, and patients who, who you want to minimize exposure to contrast. So patients with API or patients um, with allergies to contrast, patients who you want to minimize exposure to radiation. So younger patients, pregnant, uh, factors that favor CT perfusion are patients in, in whom you want to uh, directly measure and quantify ischemia, including microvascular ischemia, uh, patients in whom you want to differentiate ischemia from infarction, and patients with ACS uh, bypass or stents in whom you can't see the arteries well, but you can see perfusion. So I want to end with um, a talk, just a, a last slide, um, talking about the ischemia trial. So this uh, was presented at the uh, AHA meeting last month. And I'm sure many of you know, it's a uh, study of invasive strategy plus optimal medical therapy versus OMT alone in patients with at least moderate ischemia on stress tests. And as it pertains to us, um, so all of these patients had blinded coronary CTA to rule out unprotected left main disease and no obstructive CACD. So basically anyone with left main disease and uh, greater than 50% stenosis and anyone with no obstructive CAD on CT were excluded. So, and that's about a third of these patients. So that's a significant number. So that, that begs the question, uh, can we stop diagnostic testing at coronary CTA? So um, in anyone with a left main stenosis, we would obviously probably intervene. And in those with no CAD, um, we, we would not intervene. Um, and in those with obstructive CAD plus symptoms, we can just send these patients for um, CT perfusion or FFRCT. And the other question is, um, can we afford to, to, to not exclude left main disease? So about 5% of these patients apparently um, with ischemia, uh, or actually 5% of these patients had left main disease. Um, so even if the stress tests were normal, um, they could still have left main disease, which is concerning. So those are just some, some questions to, to think about from the study. All right, so in conclusion, uh, coronary CTA is a great gatekeeper to invasive coronary angiography. Um, both FFRCT and CT perfusion increase specificity and accuracy compared with coronary CTA alone. And FFRCT and CT perfusion are complementary and have different advantages and limitations. And future studies will help us um, see the uh, role of functional evaluation by CAD, by cardiac CT and outcomes in other patient populations. I'd like to thank Dr. Kelly Branch um, to, uh, on, for helping me with this presentation. And thank all of you for listening. Um, and follow on to that? Yeah. I don't know if you're going to think of making it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but having been in the past one, the party is like, versus the lingual practice, those are the ones that are going to be part of the Probably because of absorption, brown mouth, whatever it is. But right. Getting something that's a more potent type of dilator that you know is getting in. Yeah, I, I think one of the main, main reasons is because FFRCT analysis, we're just sending it to a vendor. Um, it takes a long time for analysis, but as far as why we don't do adenosine, I'm not exactly sure, but all the studies were done with nitroglycerin. I'm not sure if you have any ideas. Right.
Sensitivity of this is what really makes it a great test, mm -hmm. right? Right. For, for that, but um, um, and I, I get a lot of requests for them. I just wanted your thoughts. Right. So the question is um, the utility of calcium score. So that's a different talk in of itself. But as far as um, the calcium scores for the Nice guidelines, actually in the 2010 Nice guidelines, they were actually included in the evaluation of symptomatic uh, chest pain. But in, in the new uh, in the new um, 2016 update, it wasn't included. And calcium scores are more for asymptomatic patients um, as opposed to CTA, which is more for patients with symptoms. Um, as far as randomized con controlled trials, yeah, it's shown it's definitely very sensitive, um, but you have to pay out of pocket. I think it costs like $100, $150 for, for each scan. Yeah. We, we don't yet have randomized data that approach it to many patients to sort of preventative intervention based on it. Um, I think there is. Yeah. No, I was going to ask you about the Scott trial. That seemed yeah. to be, it was a huge effect. Yeah. Right? Sort of. And you sort of touched on it. You said it had to do with the change in therapies, but yeah. it was like a, um, a huge effect. Yeah. And I think you showed about 20% of the patients yeah. or so have change in therapy. And that seems to be much bigger clinical effect than I would have expected from. Yeah, um, that is, a, yeah, that's a great thought. And I think um, another thing that wasn't, that I didn't talk about was basically, well, actually I did a little bit, but it was basically patients um, in the Scott Hart trial had exercised ECG for stress testing as opposed to a nuclear stress test. So that, that is probably a big reason why, um, it's because it's exercise ECG is obviously not as accurate of a test as a nuclear diffusion study. Um, which was done in the in the promise trial. Yes, yeah, that's true. As well. I, I haven't read the two trials, but when you have different endpoints, including the first trial, procedural complications. When I look at a, at a, at a, at a trial that has multiple composite endpoints like that, and you put something in there, that I'm thinking to myself, why did they put that in there? Because it has nothing. That procedural complications is not the same as a myocardial heart. Sure. We we're kind of already violating that, the concepts of uh, positive endpoints. And now you're trying to compare the two trials, trying to say what's the medical treatment, whatever it is. So I think it's problematic to try to figure that out. That's a great point. Well, if you look at the trials and then you look actually within the data itself, when you look at myocardial infarction, which is really carrying the case for, mm -hmm. for Scott Hart, the promise was actually right on top of one another. If you look at the patients who were non obstructive coronary disease, you have a firm rate to show that that was a high risk patient group. That's where we were seeing a lot of the benefit of the patients were. It was completely flat. Our bodies were generated. My bodies were generated. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Earth were flat in all three months. There's no difference in that. Now, the type of thing that we started to have to be tested and that's what diverged and then you have mortality in actually at five years. Well, so, what I'm just saying is, when there is the overlaps until the difference in medical management kicks in, and you see this is why it's different. Yeah, I think the other thing about this is that the 
is that if you have coronary disease, you don't do as well as you don't have coronary disease, right? And we've known that for a long time. We obstructed the percent obstruction and all those kinds of things. It's the coronary disease that drives them more, right? Yeah. It's not the well, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I don't see how that affects this is a randomized trial. Yeah. I don't see how that affects that. No, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about this particular trial. Oh, okay. I don't know. Some of the other data you can present. Hopefully. Is the early in the early in the conversation that we're thinking there about you know, normal CT angiogram, which is much more able to pick up disease than you would even if your CT is not normal. So that just confirms what we're talking about. Just to add a small point to this, we're starting to these that you also talked about right here. Right, this is a, an intention and treat process, right? So a lot of folks that got the CT actually did go on to get angiography and potentially the CTI and read that person in the care, which you know, because of low sensitivity and sensitivity of some things, I think uh, mm -hmm. there may be something that's driven not just by the medication, but also by the yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so as of now, we don't have the ability to do uh, FRCT or CT perfusion yet. Um, but um, I would say uh, the Coronary CTA is very underutilized, and so um, I think in anyone with um, cardiomyopathy, we can certainly increase its use, especially in patients in, in whom we think the risk of CTA is not high. So we should look into that, um, and also to rule out chest pain as well. I think it can be utilized more more often as well. Yeah. So um, as I showed um, in one of the slides, that uh, the, the question is cost. Uh, FFR CT costs about $1,500 per study. Um, CT perfusion, we're still not sure yet at this point. Um, it's still a very new, new uh, procedure. So we expect it to cost about as much as, as a stress cycle, perhaps, um, but we're not still we're not sure at this point. But a point on that, there's a difference between cost and reimbursement. Right. right. That's true. Who's paying the cost here? Is it the insurance company? Is it pre authorization questions that are asked, or is it the patient's? Yeah. So the US Medicare um, cost. I guess I guess I think that's the same as reimbursement is uh, fifteen hundred dollars. Not sure how much it costs, like just flat flat out. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. What's the cost of the insurance? Is this something that we're going to spend thirty minutes on the phone trying to convince the insurance company to pay for, or is this something that we order and there's a high likelihood that it's going to be reimbursed? We're going to be paid for the patient's not going to be so the last asking question. Uh, I'm not sure. In Washington State. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the only workaround that we've done is that if you say rule out an anomalous coronary, you're like, oh, it's 875. You're like, oh, it's 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 Yeah, so the initial studies uh, promise used uh, 64 slice CT scanners, um, and the, the more recent ones is 256, so they're significantly better. Um, at UW, uh, the machines we have are what? Yeah, G Revolution. Yeah, 
I may be wrong, but it seems as though if you send people down the CC pathway, they're going to be getting up to four different CG scans for, for a, a, a CG uh, score, a CG angiogram, a CG perfusion, a CG FFR. Right. If you add all that up and apply it to a large population because you're expanding its use, are, are we dealing with some? serious increase in radiation exposure. Right, so that's a good question. So the question is about radiation. Um, so a coronary CTA is three millisieverts and a calcium score is one, and there are four different indications, calcium score for patients with, with, with no symptoms, in which we're assessing risk. CTA is for patients with symptoms. FFRCT doesn't require additional radiation, they're just sending it to a vendor. And CT perfusion with this uh, SCADA position is basically not that much more than a regular CTA. So. Yeah. Yeah, specs specs about 10, 10 millisieverts. And according to CTA is only three, so um, yeah, it doesn't seem to be that much. And you can't do part cardiac, you can't do a calcium score and a CTA together. If you do that, it's considered experimental by believe it or not. Um, it's a coding thing. Uh, and you can talk to uh, uh, New York, uh, and they figured that out when they did get paid for you. So, uh, anyways, you can't do both. You either have to do a CTA or a calcium So yeah, that's a great question. So it's patients in whom you want to not send to FFRCT analysis. And um, if you, you can actually send it to them and they can say whether or not they can see it. And again, they, they exclude only 10 to 20% of patients. So it's pretty good. Um, as far as stenting, there's actually active trials right now looking at that to see whether or not FFRCT is useful in the setting of stents, the uh, P3 trial and the um, decision trial, uh, which should be coming out in the, in the next couple of years. Um, but as far as, uh, as far as where a lot, yeah, but with FRCT, you can actually change the cursor to um, look at the artery, uh, various levels of it, to see whether or not um, there's good flow or not. But as far as stenting, there's active trials um, with that. Yes, I mentioned that. Because you have a blue heart back that goes with stents, and the stents are less than 2.5 millimeters, you can't see that there's a stent itself. So if you're trying to figure out how big the lumen is, and you have a blooming artifact which looks seven times bigger on the CT scan than it does on pathology, it can become very, very difficult to say how big is the lumen. And it's the size of the lumen, really the area of the lumen, which pre which tells you what's potentially going to be happening. This is just an assumption. The stent and the calcium make it so that it looks more to know what it is, so it increases the false positive, false positivity of the FFR. Um, if everyone could just hang on a couple of minutes, um, I just want to, um, uh, Jim and I make a little announcement here. For those of you who don't know, the Fed is transitioning um, to emeritus, I should say the R word, but transitioning to emeritus status. Next week, I no longer get to tell him what to do, tell him what he will do. Um, 
for the rest of the week. I just want to acknowledge some of the great uh, contributions that have made over at Harborview over the last decade. We've seen who have some GM just about a decade or so ago, and then we the chair in 2014 and technical director. And anyone who walks through the cardiology sector over at Harborview can see his impact. This was essentially um, a complete sort of reorganization of the section over there, a great um, expansion in terms of services uh, we provide, and, um, and now a whole new generation of cardiologists over there. So I first want to thank him for all of the efforts um, that he uh, did um, uh, during his time at, at Harvard. It was fantastic. And I really want to thank him for the great work that he did in the Echo Lab and supporting imaging in general over at Harborview. He read many, many, many of the Harborview echoes expertly, but not only that, he actually reached out to a variety of different echo consumers, if you will, over there, really established echo and its use in places like the trauma bays and also with endocarditis and neurology, and really was an ambassador, I think, for, for the use of echo in all of those different settings. And he really did do a great job in kind of expanding and holding the quality to a very high level uh, at Harborview in the Echo Lab. And I, I really appreciate that and all of, of his uh, great wisdom and insights in sort of getting uh, quality going in Echo and in working with Accelera, sometimes wrestling with Accelera. Uh, but he really did a, a wonderful job and I, I owe him a lot for that. And he's sort of been uh, threatening or there have been rumors <laughs> about his transition for many, many years, I've been dreading this day, but nonetheless, I just uh, really appreciate the opportunity to appreciate what, everything that you've done. It's been amazing. Thank you.